Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we are celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day by remembering the life of Admiral Jocko Clark. Joseph James Clark, uh, although he preferred to be called JJ, uh, received the nickname Jocko at the Naval Academy, where he was the first Native American graduate he would uh, go on to become the first Indigenous Peoples Admiral in the U.S. Navy. He was born in 1893 in the Indian Territory, in what would later become the state of Oklahoma. Uh, the year he was born was so long ago that the U.S. Navy still had an all-sail sailing warship out there sailing around. He was the eldest of 10 children, and so uh, leadership was thrust on him from a very young age. He, like his parents, were members of the Cherokee Nation. After a brief time at the agricultural and mechanical school that would later become Oklahoma State University, he was able to get into the United States Naval Academy, uh, where he graduated uh, just in time for World War I. In fact, he was rushed out a year early to be able to serve in the war. He was assigned to the armored cruiser USS North Carolina, which was one of the early pioneers of naval aviation. North Carolina was the first ship to have a uh, catapult installed to launch an aircraft off of. The catapult would later become a staple of both uh, aviation for battleships that use them for their spotting aircraft, using a uh, gunpowder charge to launch them into the air, and as a staple for naval aviation, using uh, primarily steam to be able to launch heavier aircraft off of the decks of aircraft carriers. Um, Ensign Clark uh, apparently was intrigued by naval aviation, and he went on to uh, go through flight training on his own during the interwar period. Uh, following flight training, he did uh, a series of stunts, training and teaching, and uh, as a as the only inspector uh, for the Navy General Board with an aviation background. So during the interwar period, this relatively junior rank officer was able to uh, contribute a significant amount to the development of U.S. Navy carrier aviation. And many of the uh, tactics and strategies and, and even the equipment that we would go to World War II with, he had a hand in developing, approving, and fine-tuning in the interwar period. At the start of World War II, he was the executive officer of USS Yorktown CV-5, uh, and he served on her during the early carrier raids and through the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. Following the loss of Yorktown, he was put in command of one of the first escort carriers in the Atlantic, the Suwannee. Uh, and after serving during the invasion of North Africa, he was sent back to the United States to take command of the new USS Yorktown CV-10, which was just being commissioned. He was sent over to the Pacific with 5th Fleet under Admiral Spruance and Mark Mitcher. And uh, Mitcher hoisted his flag on Yorktown for a period of time, uh, met at that point Captain Clark and uh, had Clark plan some of the strikes he was doing and was generally extremely impressed with the captain. And uh, so he was fast-tracked to attain the rank of rear admiral and returned to Mitcher's fleet to take over one of the carrier task groups. At this point, uh, the U.S. Navy was churning out aircraft carriers uh, several every year, and so uh, the U.S. Navy went from having hardly any aircraft carriers to multiple carrier task forces attached to each fleet. And Clark got to command one of these 
from onboards the carriers uh, Hornet CV-12 and Yorktown CV-10. He was one of the pioneering officers in using uh, his carrier aircraft for ground support, uh, even during engagements in which ground troops were not being involved. He was one of the people who came up with the idea of uh, the Japanese are using these land-based airfields to launch airstrikes on the fleet. So prior to an operation, I should take my carrier and aircraft and go and destroy these airfields and the aircraft on the ground there so that we then have a free hand in the other islands around that. Uh, so he went into the Bonin Islands where uh, Chichijima and Iwo Jima are and uh, obliterated those airfields to the point that uh, that island group was known as the Jaco Jimas to the U.S. Navy. Uh, his aviators started receiving certificates uh, saying that they belonged to the Jaco uh, Redevelopment Corporation. Jaco was one of uh, Admiral Mitcher's key admirals, and when Spruance turned 5th Fleet over to Halsey, making it 3rd Fleet, uh, he and Mitcher and Admiral Clark went back stateside for a period of time uh, before returning to take over uh, from Halsey and McCain, making 3rd Fleet into 5th Fleet again. During this time, Clark also pioneered the idea of using Marine Corps aircraft to uh, replace losses on his uh, carriers among his naval aviators who needed either a period of rest and recuperation or who lost aircraft in combat. And that is one of the uh, uh, pioneering events that uh, still carries on to this day. And now all of the carrier air groups have Marine Corps aviation assets, usually fighter squadrons, assigned to them right alongside naval aviation assets. Uh, the Marines, especially in uh, ground support, are supporting their fellow Marines on the ground. So they speak the right language uh, and they have gone through the same sort of training that their infantry counterparts have and uh, generally give better support because of that. Following World War II, Admiral Clark uh, continued to get promoted, and he uh, first commanded Task Force 77 off Korea, and then took command of the entire 7th Fleet. And uh, while in command of 7th Fleet, he flew his flag first from the battleship Missouri, and then when Missouri was relieved, he flew his flag from right here on the flag bridge of the battleship New Jersey. Uh, and from this area, he commanded all of 7th Fleet's activities in the Far East, primarily the carrier aviation ground support uh, that the U.S. Navy was given to the uh, United Nations forces in Korea at the end of the war. Uh, Clark would retire shortly after the war and uh, married the socialite Olga Clark, who uh, I'm just going to recommend right now Go ahead and look up her Wikipedia page. That is a wild ride. It doesn't really fit under the scope of what we're talking about here today, but uh, do some reading on Olga Clark. Um, Admiral Clark lived uh, up until 1971. And after he passed, the US Navy named one of the Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates USS Clark in his honor. Uh, Clark was sponsored by Olga uh, when she was christened. Uh, Admiral Clark it was interred with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery, uh, and that continues to be his resting place to this day. During his long naval career, he earned victory medals for World War I and World War II, along with a Korean War Service Medal. He earned uh, service stars for America Defense, uh, for the uh, European 
and uh, North African campaign, and he earned 12 battle stars for service in the Asiatic Pacific area, uh, among many other medals. Unfortunately, uh, Admiral Clark, despite his uh, pioneering in nature, uh, both in terms of carrier aviation and in terms of uh, being an indigenous person serving in the uh, US military is relatively unknown today. Uh, we, I was only able to find one book written about him. And uh, quite honestly, his Wikipedia page is pretty, uh, pretty poor quality. There, there's a lot more that could be written about him and his service. Uh, so, Today on uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, I am going to give you a call to action. If you are somebody who updates Wikipedia pages or uh, runs any sort of blog or website where you talk about historical characters or write about them or anything like that, look into Admiral J.J. Clark and uh, post some content about him today. Thanks for joining us. and. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you find out about Admiral Clark.